predictions, then you got to ask the question, well, why weren't prices high a year ago? We had to be little corporations then. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, for a classroom example, interruptions in oil supplies, gas prices go up a lot. Mm -hmm. And they go up so much that... Hello and welcome to the Essential Scholars Podcast. I'm Rosemarie Fike, and today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite economists, Milton Friedman. Joining me today is Dr. Stephen E. Landsberg. He's the author of the Essential Milton Friedman book, as well as many other books. He's a professor of economics at the University of Rochester, um, the author of Can You Outsmart an Economist, The Armchair Economist, the big questions, more sex is safer sex, and many more. I'm so excited to have you joining me today uh, to talk about Milton Friedman. Sometimes when I talk to my students about economists that I like, I say, oh, I spoke with this famous economist, and they're always like, there's no famous economist, but I would challenge them. I think Milton Friedman is as close to a celebrity as an economist has ever been. Uh, he certainly is, and certainly, you know, in his lifetime, he was ubiquitous. He was everywhere. You saw him on television. You saw him in magazines. Uh, he was a household name. Yeah, I, I definitely have seen those old clips from Phil Donahue, where he's on there talking about his ideas. Those are great. And he's all over YouTube, and those YouTube videos are the, the I recommend that all of your viewers uh, just randomly pull up some of those Milton Friedman videos on YouTube. They are wonderful, both in terms of the clarity with which he speaks and the wit and the warmth that comes through and the way he treats the people that he's debating with, uh, the, the honesty. He never resorts to a cheap shot. He takes everybody seriously. Uh, it, they are models of thought and, and of communication. And he had a pretty uh, strong reputation for being a very congenial scholar, even in, in seminars and debates. You know, in seminars, um, if somebody was wrong, he was ruthless. He, he, he never agreed just to get along. Uh, if, if he thought you were wrong, he would not let go. He was like a bulldog. But at the same time, he listened to every word you said, and he digested them. And if you had something to say, and if he had not realized that you had something to say, and he would listen and give you every chance to uh, uh, to make your point. And he reacted very differently depending on your own background. If you were a PhD economist, then he expected more of you than if you were a college student. And he adjusted his expectations accordingly. And you can see him treating everybody with exactly calibrated levels of respect. Uh, as, as he deals with them. What an amazing person. Uh, what was he like to interact with? I never had the opportunity myself. He passed away before I kind of got into economics. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's the warmest person I ever knew. I talked about the kindness and the respect that he showed everybody. He was always smiling, always obviously delighted to be wherever he was and talking to whoever he was talking to. If he was talking to somebody who agreed with him, if he was talking to somebody where he had no, nothing in common, no opinions in common, no knowledge in common, it didn't matter. He just, he, he beamed with delight at being able to be with people and talking to people. Uh, another thing which, uh, as long as you bring that up, and I, I think you can't talk about Milton Friedman without mentioning this, Milton and Rose Friedman had, one never knows what goes on behind the scenes, I guess, but as far as any outsider could tell, the all-time great marriage. Um, and everybody noticed this. Somehow, when the two of them were in a room, if they were at opposite ends of the room, you could just feel the energy going back and forth between them. And so many times, more times than I can count, I remember somebody being in a room with them for the first time and then commenting afterward, having discovered it on their own, not having been prepped for it, having commented about those rays of love that just seemed to go back and forth between these two people in some intangible way that you couldn't even describe. And 
And always everybody else who knew them said, oh yeah, everyone notices that. <laughs> uh, um, and I, I think, you know, the, 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 the love and the warmth and the communication that went on in that marriage was just part of the love and the warmth and the communication that went on between Milton Friedman and the whole world. Not to mention the wonderful intellectual collaboration they had. They did. They had a, a marvelous intellectual collaboration. They met in graduate school. Um, her, uh, her brother, Aaron Director, was also part of that uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, and then, of course, the great community that they created at Chicago all around themselves uh, uh, was a, a, a marvelous thing. Well, Friedman sounds like such an all around just amazing person, somebody who just really enjoyed living his life and, and you know, d diving into the ideas that he contributed to. Can you talk a little bit about his training and background and kind of what influenced him and his work? Well, he started out really in uh, statistics where he did he did important work in statistics that um, statisticians still use today when they analyze data. Um, he um, um, during the war, he was doing uh, war work and uh, which drew a lot on the uh, statistics uh, uh, work that he had done and his knowledge of statistics. And then somehow he moved on into economics. I'm, I'm not sure uh, that I know exactly what was going on in his mind or, or exactly what the influences were, but uh, he, he moved on to economics at some point pretty early on. Um, still, of course, his, the great depth of his, not just his knowledge of statistics, but his an intuitive feel for statistics really informed his work in economics. Uh, it's not like that went to waste. Uh, uh, Milton Friedman was among the great economists of the 20th century. I would argue probably the one with the greatest intuitive feel for what statistics meant. Uh, the one who could look at numbers, George Stigler was also great with this, but he could look at a table of numbers and he could see what it was telling him in a way that um, many of us just have to envy. Uh, so so the background was there, uh, but then he, he became, um, I know we were talking just before the broadcast about occupational licensing. He became interested in that very early on. And that became one of the first things he thought about uh, seriously in economics. Um, at the time, there was a lot of intellectual ferment around the question of how do households decide how much to spend? Mm -hmm. uh, that turns out to be a really important question for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's just an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, why do some households spend more than others and what goes into that decision-making process? I think a lot of us find that an interesting question all on its own, but it also has big policy implications. If you're going to change tax policy, if you're going to change monetary policy, it's going to affect the way people spend and that's going to affect other things that you care about. You're never going to be able to make predictions about those things unless you understand how people make those spending decisions. So a lot of people, including Rose Friedman, were very um, uh, excited about trying to explain that. There were a lot of apparent paradoxes in the data, things that didn't seem to fit, uh, things that seemed contradictory. And he got very interested in that, uh, possibly partly through Rose and partly through uh, his other colleagues and just his general reading. Um, and he really bit into that one. That was his first really uh, magnificent piece of work in economics where he solved a lot of problems. He resolved a lot of those paradoxes in ways that nobody else had been able to. You can see his influence as a statistician. He was very big on um, settling questions by you know looking at the empirical evidence. Um, Absolutely. I mean, there were... Uh, there were a handful of people in the 20th century who I think you could call great economists and they each had their own strengths and weaknesses. And that was, uh, again, as I said before, I think this is the one uh, area where he was indisputably the, the, the very greatest. And he was very big on, even though he's addressing a lot of macro questions in his work, he's very big on tying it back to those micro foundations. Absolutely. In fact, that's that's the other thing that really distinguishes him, I think, from the other great economists of the 20th century. The insistence that everything had to be comprehensible in terms of micro foundations, which means things like understanding how households make spending decisions, understanding how individuals make choices 
and how those choices interact with each other to lead to um, uh, broader outcomes. Milton Friedman is, is thought of largely as a macroeconomist, and much of his uh, lasting work, much of his most important influential work was in macroeconomics. But more than any other macroeconomist, he was always saying we need to understand this at a micro level. We need to understand the micro foundations. Yes, we want to understand the implications of a change in monetary policy, but we're never going to understand that unless we understand how it affects individual households, individual people, and how it affects their decision making. And everything in his mind had to be based on that. So that although he was world famous as a macroeconomist, his teaching was mostly in microeconomics. Uh, when he taught graduate courses, he taught the micro economics courses at Chicago because he believed that that was the foundation for all of economics, that that um, uh, the, the whole micro-macro split that was uh, standard at that time and still in many ways is, he never subscribed to it. He, he believed that microeconomics was economics and macroeconomics was applied microeconomics. <laughs> I like that view of it. I think that's kind of overlaps with my own view. I also think that approach allowed him to resolve some of these paradoxes in a way that seemed obvious to him, but not so obvious to other people. Absolutely. So let's, let's talk about his permanent income hypothesis, because that's kind of what you've been alluding to um, in your uh, mention of how households spend money. So can you talk a little bit about that? What is that permanent income hypothesis? And what are kind of the policy implications? Because it's a big challenge to, to Keynesian approaches. The, the permanent income hypothesis, which uh, really was um, his first really big contribution and arguably his greatest contribution and certainly the, the uh, the basis for his Nobel Prize, a big part of the basis for his Nobel Prize, was the permanent income hypothesis, which resolved uh, a lot of these questions we were talking about uh, regarding how households make spending decisions. And the observation, which which seems nowadays like, it, whether it's obvious or not, it seems like a very simple observation, but it was earth shattering at the time, was the idea that when your income goes up, it, you know, pe people were asking the question, if your income goes up, how much of that extra income do you save and how much do you spend? And Friedman's great observation there was that it all depends on whether you expect your income to have risen temporarily or permanently. If I get a one-time bonus from my boss of $5,000, I'm going to react to that very differently than if I'm going to react to a raise of $5,000. Either one of them puts $5,000 in my pocket right now. But if it's a one-time bonus, I'm going to think more, I'm going to be more inclined to save some of that, uh, save more of it and spend less of it because I know it's one time and I want to spread out the joy of, of getting that bonus. If it's a $5,000 raise that I'm going to get every year, then I might feel like, wow, I can raise my spending by $5,000 a year now because my income is up by $5,000 a year. Very simple observation, and yet it resolved a lot of what seemed to be paradoxical in the data, households responding very differently to changes in income. He said, well, you, you have to look at whether those changes in income are permanent or temporary. And um, that that in turn has has big consequences for things like fiscal policy, uh, because uh, if government wants to encourage spending for some reason, if they believe we're in a recession, then it would be a good thing for whatever reason to get people to try to get people to spend more. Uh, one way they try to do that is by putting money in people's pockets. And um, Friedman argued, and I think extremely convincingly and, and extremely influentially, that if you put $100 in somebody's pocket, and if they believe you're only doing it once, they're not going to spend that hundred dollars. They're going to save most of it. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, individual households may behave differently, but on average, they're going to mostly save it. They're not going to spend it. And your attempt to encourage uh, uh, spending is not going to work. Uh, on top of that, we have the fact that if your households are a little more sophisticated, they're going to notice that 
well, the government just gave everybody $100. They must have borrowed that someplace. They're going to have to pay it back in the future. That means my taxes are going up in the future. That's an even bigger reason to save. Uh, so uh, uh, giving everybody $100 might not lead to any additional spending at all. Which is very contrary to what Keynes suggested. It's very contrary to what, now you say what Keynes suggested. I want to be a little careful because I want to admit that I've never actually read Keynes's general theory. And um, I, I am familiar with what people say that he said, but I'm also familiar with the fact that some people think that he has been a little bit misrepresented. So I'm not actually sure exactly what Keynes said, but it was very contrary to what the economists who were calling themselves Keynesians were saying. Correct. And very contrary to what was sort of the mainstream view at the time about, about how to handle policy issues like this. So it's consistent with the Keynesian style policy, not necessarily with Keynes's own arguments. Yeah. Um, but what do we have any real world evidence that Friedman was right about the kind of lackluster response people might have to stimulus? Uh, we do. I'm. Um... And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you honestly, and people who read my books are already aware of this. I, I, I am, um, uh, I think, I really think, uh, I'm a strong believer that it's more important to understand the ideas than to get deep into the data. Um, uh, so, you know, we could talk uh, uh, about the statistical methods that people use to analyze the data, to test these things. Um, if you wanted to have a podcast about that, I'm probably not the person you should have invited in the first place. But um, uh, I think understanding the ideas of why you would expect these outcomes mm -hmm. is a lot more interesting and a lot more important because it's more widely applicable when you find yourself in a in a new situation you hadn't anticipated. It's more important to understand the ideas than the specifics of a, of a given case. So I'm, I'm not a good person to sit here and talk about the details of the data and the statistical evidence. But uh, I can tell you that uh, these ideas have come to permeate economics. They, you, you cannot uh, uh, study macroeconomics. You cannot study consumption behavior without confronting the permanent income hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And there certainly have been variations on it. People have uh, argued that Friedman didn't have it exactly right. Uh, but the, the, the basic idea that we have to distinguish between permanent and temporary changes in income and uh, the other thing Friedman did with that was he uh, showed in a very detailed way exactly what kinds of policy mistakes you would make if you failed to notice this important distinction. Uh, so that a, a lot of analysis went into um, uh, looking at numbers, looking at uh, uh, actual numbers and asking, you know, if you were an economist who had not thought about this permanent income hypothesis, how would you interpret those numbers? Why is that leading to a lot of mistakes in policy? And all of that, mm -hmm. uh, nobody can do economics anymore without confronting those those ideas. And so uh, I think the best evidence that a lot of it was right was that nobody disputes most of it anymore. Um, uh, people mm -hmm. who have, people on all sides who, who uh, study economics have found it indispensable to incorporate these ideas. When I think of Milton Friedman, and this might be because I teach intermediate macro a lot, uh, but when I think of Milton Friedman, I think about the quantity theory of money. I think about monetary economics. Um, can we talk about his idea of, of, you know, how do we explain inflation? How does that come about? Um, he has a pretty famous quote that, uh, People mention quite a bit uh, that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So, so what does that mean? Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Well, but, but, uh, I'm happy to talk about what it means. And again, it's a very uh, important and influential uh, circle of ideas that nobody can ignore. Uh, I'm, I suspect if you've been teaching macroeconomics, uh, and I have not taught it for a long time, you are probably more on top than I am of, uh, you know, what has, what has survived from that circle of ideas and what has had to be modified. All ideas over time have to be modified. And in particular, when it comes to monetary theory, the monetary uh, world has changed. It's very different than it was in Friedman's time. 
the banking industry is much less regulated for one thing, but we have all these additional financial instruments. We have money market funds, we have crypto, we have, uh, we're living in a world that he could not have anticipated. So um, again, what's important here is not the specific conclusions, but the ways of thinking. And the, the, uh, the important way of thinking is that prices are determined by, um, by two things how much money is out there and how much of that money people want to keep in their pockets or, or in their bank accounts. Excuse me a second. Once you know how much money is out there and once you know how much money people want to own, uh, the remainder of that money is the money that they're going to be trying to get rid of. And the one way to get rid of money is to buy stuff and buying stuff bids up prices. So if there is more money, then people are going to want to, uh, uh, people, there's going to be more money than people want to hold. If you, if you create more money, I, well, let's talk about um, Friedman's great helicopter analogy. Mm -hmm. If a bunch of helicopters come, uh, I currently have in my pocket and in my bank account, the amount of money I want to have in my pocket and in, in my bank account. I have, I have enough money in my pocket so I can buy a Coke if I want to. And I, I, I think, well, maybe I want to stop and get gas. Of course, I don't carry money for that anymore. I do it with a credit card. But um, I, have, I have in my pocket maybe $10, and that's about what I want to carry. If a bunch of helicopters were to fly over uh, and drop a bunch of money on the ground, I would run and pick some up, uh, as would we all. And then I would have more money in my pocket than I want to have. Uh, and I would want to get rid of it. Uh, if Now I've got $100 in my pocket. Well, if I had wanted $100 in my pocket, I would have had $100 in my pocket in the first place. I would have gone to the ATM. I don't want that much in my pocket. i got to get rid of it. How can I get rid of it? I can try to buy things. Well, everybody's trying to buy things because they all picked up some money. That's going to bid up prices. I could take some of that money and put it in the bank. But that doesn't actually solve the problem because now my banker has more money in his or her pocket than than... Than, than he wanted to have this morning. That money is like, uh, I think Friedman used the analogy, a hot potato. Uh, I can get rid of it by lending it to somebody, but then that person has more money than they want. I can uh, put it in the bank, then the banker has more money than they want. Sooner or later, somebody's got to try to spend it, and that's going to push prices up. Uh, the other side of that equation is that uh, uh, if something changes the amount of money we want to hold, that's also going to have an effect if suddenly, uh, you know, I used to pay cash for gas. Now I pay for gas with a credit card. S because of that, I want less money in my pocket. And at some point, I had to get rid of some of the money in my pocket. Uh, and that's, so whatever I did to get rid of that money, bid prices up at that point. Friedman's argument was that by and large, the things that change the demand for money, the things that change the amount of money we want in our pockets, tend to be gradual, slow, predictable, not sudden, not unexpected, not unpredictable. So that the, um, for the most part, and he certainly would not have said exclusively, but for the most part, prices are caused not by changes in the demand for money, but changes in the supply of money, not by changes in the amount we want in our pockets, but by changes in what comes from the helicopters. Of course, it doesn't actually come from helicopters. It comes from the Federal Reserve, but it might as well come from helicopters. They're creating money. They're uh, putting it into the system, and somebody's ending up with that money, and that somebody is going to try to get rid of it. Uh, I think, again, the world has become a more complicated place. There are many, many more kinds of money now. There are many more ways to hold your money and more ways to manage your money. And and it is, uh, I, I think it is probably not true that the old quantity theory in Friedman's sense is, uh, uh, is a completely, you're not going to be able to do macroeconomics based just on that. Uh, but at the time, it seemed to work extremely well. And again, it contained in it the foundations for how to think about a changing world. Um, uh, at that time, he was able to say, okay, demand is something slow, gradual, predictable. 
it's all about supply, but he also showed us how to think about what happens in a world where demand is not slow, gradual, and predictable. Mm -hmm. And certainly the Federal Reserve has um, adopted policies of trying to manage not just the supply of money, but also the demand for money. Um, that's not something that I think Friedman would have foreseen or approved of based on the world he lived in then, mm -hmm. but I expect he would approve of it based on the world we live in now, where demand is a lot more um, uh, malleable than it was at that time. Again, I haven't taught macroeconomics in a long time. You have, and so maybe you're the one who should be talking more about this and not me. Well, I want to hear what you have to say about Friedman's ideas. Um, so Friedman's view of inflation overturned kind of a, a dominant view at the time that you mentioned in the book called cost push inflation. Can you talk about what that was because i i hear arguments today about some of the inflation that we're experiencing i hear some people making similar style arguments in terms of of price level rises yeah uh, i'm so that that was uh, my sense is that that was sort of the dominant view before friedman it's it's certainly not now it might you hear it from journalists i don't yes, think you hear it absolutely. much from economists um and the idea was that well um uh the cost of of some input to making uh, uh, the cost of fertilizer goes up and that drives up the price of wheat and then um, uh, that in turn drives up the price of wheaties which are made out of wheat and that in turn drives up um, uh, maybe I picked a, a poor example because I'm having trouble thinking of the chain <laughs> as it goes from here, but that somehow um, costs go up and then because costs go up, manufacturers raise their prices mm -hmm. and the prices that they're raising, those yeah. become costs for the next person who's going to use their products. And so those costs go up and that drives up further prices and so on. Uh, if you, if you, it sounds a little plausible on the surface. If you think about it uh, more carefully, uh, it's a little hard to um, it, it's it's hard to make it work in theory if uh, if the cost of one thing goes up after all, and if I'm gonna now gonna have to spend more for that wheat, that means I've got less available to spend on some other thing, and so I'm going to be trying to buy less of some other thing, and you would think that would bring down the uh, price of that other thing. Uh, it all comes back again to the amount of money I want to have in my pocket. If I'm spending more on wheat and I still want to have $20 in my pocket all the time, then I've got to spend less on corn or on books or on some other thing. Uh, so uh, the cost going up in one sector of the economy, you might expect to bring prices down in another sector. Mm -hmm. And Friedman argued that it's pretty hard then to explain a general inflation on that basis. Um Another aspect of this, I'm not sure whether you would call it part of the cost push theory or whether it's a separate thing. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say that, well, prices are going up because of uh, somehow monopoly power. Firms are manipulating prices in order to raise, mm -hmm. uh, uh, raise their profits. Um, Friedman, I'm, I'm probably others, but Friedman very eloquently made the point that that's not a theory of why prices are rising. That's a theory of why prices would always be high. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you're, if your argument is that prices are going up because of greedy, manipulative corporations, then you got to ask the question, well, why weren't prices high a year ago? We had the same greedy, manipulative corporations then. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, and I, I love this uh, for a classroom example, uh, sometimes when we see interruptions in oil supplies, gas prices go up a lot. And mm -hmm. they go up so much that the oil company's profits increase. Um, you know, it could have gone either way. Uh, their costs are going up. Oil's harder to get. Their costs are going up. They're also selling it for a higher price. You might have thought their profits might go down, might go up. Prices go up so much that their profits go up. And my students, I find when I survey them, tend to think that that's evidence of collusion on the part of the oil companies. They managed to raise prices so much that their profits went up. And I point out to them, it's actually evidence of exactly the opposite because what did we learn from this episode? 
we learned that if they raise prices, their profits go up. And that means that if they were capable of colluding, they would have done it 10 years ago. They wouldn't have waited for a, uh, um, an interruption in oil supplies. Raising their prices might raise profits, might lower profits, because it would reduce the amount of gasoline people want to buy. Until we saw this incident, we didn't know whether raising their prices would increase mm -hmm. profits. Now we've learned that raising prices increases profit. That tells me that if they've got the capacity to collude, they would have been colluding all along. Prices mm -hmm. would not be going up all that much now because they already would have been as high as the market can bear. What we've learned from this is that they're actually competing with each other. <laughs> not immediately intuitive to the non-economist. Uh, and I, I know that from talking to my students. And I, I, I just recently, I happened to have done this example in class and I saw one of my students, a very strong student, um, sitting listening very intently. And when I got to the punchline, she sort of gasped and put her hand over her mouth. And that's that's just the kind of moment you 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 live for when you're a teacher. I mean, a, clearly a, a light had gone off in her in her yeah, mind. I definitely love those moments to just see the the little mind get blown a little bit by seeing the world uh, through that economic lens. Um, so. Building off of you know this quantity theory of money, um, that had some implications for how Friedman thought we should conduct monetary policy, right? So much so we call it the Friedman rule. So how did you know what what was what was Friedman's view about monetary policy and and maybe why shouldn't we target a 0% inflation rate or maybe even deflation? Well, uh, Friedman did uh, um, argue that in an ideal world, we would have uh, a bit of deflation. And the reason for that, it's a little bit subtle, but look, when I choose to hold $50 in my pocket instead of 20, I'm doing the whole world a favor because that's an extra $30 that I'm not spending. That's an extra $30 worth of apples or pears or peaches that I'm not buying. And that's an extra $30 worth of apples, pears, or peaches that's available to somebody else. And the price of those apples and pears and peaches is going to come down because I'm not trying to buy them. So every time I put more money in my pocket, I'm doing the whole world a favor. That means we ought to encourage people to carry more money. And one way to encourage people to carry more money is to say to them, hey, as you walk around with that money in your pocket, it's going to grow in value. Uh, how do you guarantee people that? You have deflation. Deflation means that the dollar in my pocket today is going to be worth $1.05 tomorrow and $1.10 the next day, well, or whatever the deflation rate is. So the idea was that deflation is good. I'll just repeat the steps. Deflation is good because in a world with deflation, I will say, hey, money in my pocket just keeps growing in value. I'm going to put money in my pocket. And when I put that money in my pocket, I buy less stuff. And that does the world a favor because everybody else's money is now worth more. Everybody else's money is now worth more because I put that money in my pocket. Um, and that in an ideal world, that would you would want to have a small amount of deflation. Now, on the other hand, uh, how do you create deflation? The way you create deflation is that uh, government has to destroy some money. And where are they going to get that money to destroy? Basically, they have to sell stuff and and um, uh, dispose of the, uh, basically burn the money that they collect. On the other hand, the government doesn't want to sell stuff. Uh, they they want to buy stuff. They want to they want to buy. Uh, all kinds of social programs, all kinds of military gear. And they've got to finance that somehow. Um, now, they finance it with taxes. They finance it with borrowing, which means future taxes. Borrowing is just borrowing money that they have to pay back in the future, and ultimately they have to tax somebody. Or they can finance it by printing money, um, which creates inflation. And the positive side of inflation from that point of view is that it means there are fewer taxes. Inflation is itself like a tax, but I'll treat it as separately from taxes. Um, 
the more inflation we have, the fewer taxes we need because the government creates inflation by printing money and then uh, they've got more money so they don't have to tax coffee as much. Um, so there's an upside to deflation because it gets us to carry more money in our pockets. There's an upside to inflation uh, because uh, it means that the government has a source of money and so they don't have to raise other taxes as much as they as much as they otherwise would. Uh, you want to balance those things against each other. And Friedman came down uh, basically after balancing them together in favor of an inflation rate of maybe 2% a year, I think, um, uh, varying a little depending on circumstances. But uh, uh, more important than the exact inflation rate was the idea that it should be slow and steady and predictable uh, because it's important for people to be able to understand the value of money. In a time of high inflation, a time of unpredictable inflation, I go to the store and I say, oh, wow, they, they raised the price of those pork chops by a dollar. What does that mean? Are pork chops getting more expensive or is everything getting more expensive? I have to figure that out before I can decide how many pork chops I want to buy. Um, if everything is getting more expensive, I might as well buy the pork chops. If it's just the pork chops that got more expensive, uh, and, and I'm not sure what's going on because I don't know what's going on with inflation, and people end up making a lot of bad decisions for that reason. Not just buying pork chops, but you know, should I expand my business? I sell bicycles. The price of bicycles just went up. Uh, what's going on there? Is this inflation? Everything's going up? Or is it just the price of, if it's just the price of bicycles going up, I want to make more bicycles. I want to expand my factory. If it's everything going up, maybe I don't want to do that. And I'm confused. I can't tell what's going on. There's so much in the news. It all conflicts each other. Friedman's idea was that that's a real problem, a real problem. And um, it's a problem that's caused by inflation, which is separate from the other issues we just talked about with inflation and deflation. And it's a reason why whatever inflation rate you've got, you want it to be predictable and steady so that people get used to it and know how to respond to it and know how to live with it so they don't make all these mistakes. And that, that was, that was a very big part of what he had to say. Sounds very, um, very Austrian business cycle in, in a way. For the second time here, I'm going to uh, admit um, a, a sort of some that I'm the wrong person for you to ask about this. I am not well versed in Austrian business cycle theory, so I'm going to take your word on that. <laughs> we had a previous podcast episode with Chris Coyne, and we talked a bit uh -huh. about that. So this was very reminiscent of that. Um, one of the other things that Friedman kind of challenged related to inflation was this perceived inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. And the conclusion that people had at the time was that if we wanted to lower unemployment rates, we could just tolerate a little bit of inflation and, and deal with that. Um, so, so what challenge did Friedman offer to that? Well, you're, you're exactly um, uh, continuing with the ideas I was just speaking about. We see in the data sometimes that when inflation goes up employment goes up and what friedman said was let's think about the reason for that and it comes back to what we were talking before about always thinking about the micro level yeah. inflation goes up employment goes up i may have said unemployment a moment ago i meant employment inflation goes up employment goes up Friedman, always the microeconomist, said, let's think about why that happens. And he said, I think a lot of the time it's this. It's that bicycle manufacturer. Inflation goes up a little bit. He notices that the price of bicycles just went up. He gets confused. He doesn't realize it's because of inflation. He thinks that suddenly a lot more people want bicycles. So he expands his factory. He hires more people. That's why employment goes up. It's a mistake. And as soon as he figures out what's going on, as soon as he figures out that, oh, there's no more demand for bicycles than there was before, this was just, I got fooled by inflation, he's going to fire those workers, okay? Or he's going to lower their wages and they're going to quit. The result, and this was a mistake for everybody. Nobody actually gained anything from it. Um, here we had workers who took these jobs because 
they got offered what they thought were high wages. They didn't realize that these wages just looked high because of inflation and that they're really not worth much more than the wages they were offered the other day. We fooled workers into taking jobs they wouldn't have wanted if they'd understood. We fooled um, uh, the business into, into expanding in ways they wouldn't have if they'd understood. Yes, you saw a little rise in employment, but that wasn't a good thing. It wasn't permanent and it wasn't a good thing. Moreover, this has a very strong implication you can test. It says that only unexpected inflation matters. If people expect the inflation, they're not going to make these mistakes. So uh, this is an idea, and I sh we should mention also Edmund Phelps, the other great Nobel Prize winning economist who had pretty much the same idea about the same time. Um, Friedman and Phelps both independently had ideas very, very much along these lines. Uh, it became... Uh, this became the key uh, uh, circle of ideas that drove macroeconomics for a very long time after that, through the through the 1970s and 80s. Uh, many Nobel Prizes were won by people fleshing out those ideas and figuring out what it meant and understanding, once again, in the same flavor as what we said back when we were talking about the permanent income hypothesis, that the data appear to be telling you one thing, but if you understand the microeconomics, if you understand why people are behaving the way they're behaving, then you see that the data are actually telling you something very different. Well, we're almost out of time for part one of our chat. And so hopefully next session, we can talk a bit about this Chicago price theory and how Friedman used price theory to answer a variety of questions that um, are really important to the average person, sure. um, including policy questions. So thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to, to chatting with you again. Thanks. You've been listening to Essential Scholars, a new podcast series that explores the ideas and insights of some of history's most influential thinkers. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and head over to EssentialScholars.org to learn more. See you next time.